Good afternoon. Welcome to the April 9th policy session of the Phoenix City Council. We'll call the meeting to order and we'll begin with roll call. Will the clerk call the roll? Councilwoman Guardado. Here. Councilwoman Hodge Washington. Here. Councilwoman O'Brien. Councilwoman Pastor. Here. Councilman Robinson. Here. Councilman Waring. Here. Vice Mayor Stark. Here. Mayor Gallego. Here. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'll begin with council information and follow up requests. We'll begin with the vice mayor and then we'll go to Councilwoman Hunt Washington. Thank you, Mayor. And this will be very short, but I want to pay uh, tribute to Levy Bornstein. She was um, the founder of Chompies along with her husband, and she passed away a couple days ago. I will tell you, I've spoken to many people that have grown up in District 3 and remember the original Chompies. As a matter of fact, I think one of your staffers actually went to Shadow Mountain. He talked about how they would skip lunch, skip school, so they could go to Chompies and get a cookie from Lovely. So I, I think it, she's just a wonderful woman. Sorry that she passed away. But as we all know, Chompies is an institution in the city of Phoenix, and so um, it's with great honor that I can say I knew her, and um, I will continue, of course, to go to Chompies. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you so much. February 14th, 2022 was Chompies' 43rd anniversary and Bornstein Family Appreciation Day in the city of Phoenix. It has been wonderful to hear from so many folks who were impacted by Lovey. We'll go next to Councilwoman Hodge Washington and then Councilwoman Guardado. Thank you, Mayor. Since our last policy meeting, I've been on the move around District 8, and I just want to highlight a few of the things that I've been working on. Next slide. It was an honor to commemorate a legend in District 8 with the unveiling of a ceremonial sign for Vernell Myers Coleman at 7th Avenue and Buckeye Road. As a community advocate for more than 40 years, she worked to improve the lives of people living in poverty in Phoenix. She is remembered for reviving the celebration of Juneteenth in Phoenix, instrumental in helping to organize St. Mary's Food Bank, and so much more. Also, I served as a judge for the Future Star STEM competition held at the South Mountain Community College in my district. The event is for middle and high school students. It was de designed to provide an opportunity for them to explore coding through physical computing. They created and designed a STEM solution and presented their project to the community. It was an impressive gathering of students. Also, as part of the final four events, one of the most established neighborhoods with a rich history look, took center court as the NCAA dedicated their legacy project at East Lake Park and Community Center. Later in the week, I took a private tour with NCAA President Charlie Baker of the East Lake Community Center, and it was so nice to showcase the gem in our community. Next slide, please. Believe it or not, the NCAA was not the only game in town. I was excited to celebrate opening day with the Phoenix Mercury in the historic warehouse district. The Suns and the Mercury are an important part of our community and opening a new team member campus not too far from the arena will bring new energy and contribute to the revitalization of the warehouse district in Phoenix. From collaboration spaces to pickleball, the space has it all and I'm so thrilled that it's in District 8. This weekend, Miss Juneteenth Arizona, Sasha Revron, invited me to be a panelist at the Teen Engage Conference 2024. This impressive group of young gathered together early on a Saturday morning to work towards their goal of inspiring the next generation of the civically engaged. I also attended three community budget hearings, a community-wide hearing, the community-wide bilingual hearing, and the hearing held in my district. I learned a lot from our community and look forward to working on a budget that meets the needs as best as we can. Next slide. <coughs> on Saturday, April 6, I also co-hosted an event with Zion Institute for a free community event with free books, entertainment, resources, creative workshops, and much more. It was a fun event with Empowering Arizona, Transformative Justice, Zion Institute, and the Phoenix Metropolitan Alumni Chapter. 
Finally, I attended the Levine and South Mountain Community Picnic at Ashley's Backyard. Charity Tovar, along with the Levine Community Council, South Mountain and Levine Chamber of Commerce, and Armadio, Caf sorry, Armadio Ranch did an excellent job of hosting an event that has the perfect balance of unity, resources, and fun. Next slide, please. My staff and I are looking forward to the upcoming events we'll be participating in for the remainder of this month and next month. On April 20th at 9.30 at the Maryville Estrella Precinct Coffee with a Cop will be at El Cafezito located at 7540 West Indian School Road. We're also going to celebrate Spring's arrival with friends and neighbors and support local businesses at the Fiesta on Central Avenue. Join us for food, fun, music, and much more on Saturday, April 20th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the northeast corner of Central and Baseline Road in Phoenix. And on May 4th, we ask you to join us for Party in Pierce at 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at Pierce Park. Next slide, please. As always, do not hesitate to reach out if you need help with any city resources or notice an issue in your neighborhood. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. We'll go next to Councilwoman Guardado and then Councilwoman Pastor. Thank you, Mayor. Budget hearings, your voice matters. It's time to make it heard at the upcoming in-person budget hearings. Learn about the city manager's trial budget and share your thoughts and opinions. The city budget funds everything from parks and streets, maintenance to water services, police, and the fire department. The Council District 5 hearing will be tomorrow, Wednesday, April 10th at 6 p.m. at the Maryvale Community Center, 4420 North 51st Avenue in the multi-purpose room. The Spanish language hearing in cooperation with Council District 4 will be Tuesday, April 16th at 6 p.m. also at the Maryvale Community Center multi-purpose room. The District 5 Maryvale Jobs and Resource Fair, if you or someone you know are looking for a new career or resources, please join us for an annual Maryvale Jobs and Resource Fair to be held this Saturday, April 13th at the Maryvale Community Center from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. In partnership with Parks and Recs Department, we invite the local elementary school districts, labor, and City of Phoenix apprenticeships, city departments, and community partners to offer jobs, information, and resources to our residents. In addition to great information for job seekers, we provide a fun family atmosphere with fun activities for kids and music, so definitely bring the family. There will also be free health screenings and food trucks available. District 5 will also be hosting two exciting park activation events on Saturday, April 20th. The first will be at Washington Park for a community cleanup starting at 9 a.m. and ending at 10.30. After the cleanup, we will be moving over near the dark park for a family fun event from 10.30 a.m. to 12.30. We will be meeting in the grassy park area just north of the dark park. We will have food, truck, music, a bounce house, and so much more. Please come and join us. The second event is on Saturday, the 20th, will be the Spring Festival at El Oso Park. Bring your kids, participate in games with a raffle prize, enjoy music, educational information, resources, free haircuts at the Spring Festival in partnership with the Estrella Supermoms. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilwoman Pastor. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> If you look at this picture, uh, this is me with Cesar Chavez in 1992, um, as I was at uh, ASU and the uh, president of Mecha, and I found, happened to find the, the picture, someone sent it to me. So uh, incredible, uh, great hairdo days. Um, but uh, si se puede, as I'm still in the fight. Next slide. CVS uh, invested more than $3 million to support health organizations in Phoenix. Uh, CVS will provide free screenings to detect early risks of diabetes, hypertension, and heart disease starting this month. So if you see the code or you can get the code, you scan it and you can get an appointment. Tomorrow will be, next slide, tomorrow will be my coffee chat at Luana's. Uh, police and neighborhood services will be there, so looking forward to seeing you. Next slide. Our third annual 5K with the Ameri uh, African American Reconstruction Group was a huge success. We raised over $1,000 for scholarship fund and support some of the local black vendors. Next slide. 
A well-earned congratulations to the Public Works Department. They were recognized at the 42nd Annual Environmental Excellence Award. The Food Waste Program diverted over 67,000 tons pounds of waste to the landfill. Next slide. The City of Phoenix launched the new Ciudad de Phoenix Facebook page to connect with Spanish-speaking residents. This page offers information about city services, local events, and important news, and more. Councilwoman Guardado and I, next slide, will be at the Joint District 4 and District 5 budget hearing next Tuesday at the Maryvale Community Center. The hearing will be held in Spanish. English translation will be available. Next slide. Uh, oh, there. Oh, sorry. Uh, join us this Saturday at Steel Indian School Park for a free family friendly neighborhood concert. Uh, thank you to the Carnation Association of Neighborhoods for hosting. Next slide. Chispa, Arizona is hosting an Earth Day festival at Celito Park next Saturday. And if you have any questions, you can always contact my office. I also want to recognize uh, Monica Villalobos and congratulate her in her marriage this past weekend. So thank you. Thank you. I wanted to start with a quick thank you to those involved in producing the Phoenix History Video City Series. A group of dedicated residents contributed their time and effort to chronicle the history of our great city. Thank you to Council Member Jacob Butler of the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian Community, Jared Riddle, Regina Best, Andrea Barrera, Mark Tobo, Anthony Pratcher II, our city staff, and our mayor's office historian, Steve Schumacher. It's been a big news week for the city of Phoenix and the state of Arizona. Yesterday, President Biden announced $6.6 .6 billion in CHIPS Act funding for TSMC in District 1 in Phoenix. They also announced their intentions to build a new fab facility, a third one, to make the world's most advanced microchips, two nanometer, so small it's hard to describe. It's extremely impactful and will mean great jobs and prosperity for, fam for families for generations to come. We think it is the largest foreign direct investment in a greenfield project in the United States history at $65 billion want to congratulate Sky Harbor Airport on winning a Employer of the Year, the Employer of the Year Award from Women in Transportation. Um, some tougher news today. This morning, the state Supreme Court took us back in time by 160 years when they upheld the 1864 territorial abortion ban. This is devastating to so many families. Phoenix is a pro-choice city. We believe women should be able to make their own health care decisions. They should be able to decide when and if they start a family. When Roe was overturned, this council voted to work with our police chief to deprioritize any calls related to abortion law violations. That policy still applies. While this ruling is dark, we can't use hope, and we call upon our lawmakers to defend women's most basic rights. Any additional updates before we move on? Right. Item number one is the Expenditure Limit Task Force. I want to thank our task force, Chairwoman Monica Villalobos, Rachel Aha, Todd Sanders, Brian Willingham, and the late Robin Reed. This is not the first time many of you have served our community. Even in this capacity, and I want to thank you for your service. So I want to take a moment to honor Robin Reed, the CEO of the Black Chamber of Arizona and a good friend to so many across our community. Robin went above and beyond, whether in business, education, or just being a friend. He was a champion for Phoenix and our region. He saw the hope and promise in our city, and we will all work to carry on Robin's legacy of service to others in community. We are so sorry to have lost him. We'll next turn to our Budget and Research Director, Amber Williamson, to introduce this important topic. Thank you, Mayor, members of the Council, and residents. I am pleased to be here today with our City uh, Expenditure Limit Task Force Chairwoman, Monica Villalobos, Deputy Budget and Research Director, Aaron Mertz. They'll be helping me to present this item today. So, Council, the State Expenditure Limitation item is a constitutional amendment that was approved by the voters of Arizona in 1980. 
It restricts spending for cities and towns to levels based in 1979-80, adjusted only for two factors, population and inflation. We received the population factors straight from the state demographer's office, and the inflation factors are provided to us from the Arizona Department of Revenue. They rely on the National Economic Bureau of Analysis through the United States Gross Domestic Product Implicit Price Deflator. Those factors are what's used to calculate our annual spending limit. As you know, Phoenix is the fifth largest city in the country. We've grown considerably since 1980. We're a regional leader. It's for these reasons we're not able to meet that strict formulaic limit. City of Phoenix expenditure growth across all city departments and funds exceeds those population and inflation factors. In order for the city to comply, we would have to reduce our annual expenditures across all city departments and funds by an estimated $2 billion. This represents about 30% of the total city operating budget. If the city does not comply with the state spending limit or have the voters approve an alternative, there would be a non-compliance penalty based on state statute. That penalty is estimated to be one-third of our state shared income tax revenue. As a reminder, state shared income tax revenue is allocated 100% to our general fund. We're estimating that would be a loss in revenue of $120 million in fiscal year 25-26. I'm now going to hand over the presentation to Aaron Mertz, who's going to walk through the options that the task force considered to recommend to the city, as well as a history of how City Phoenix has complied with the state law. Thank you, Mayor, uh, Mayor, members of the council. As Amber mentioned, there are three main alternatives that cities and towns can use uh, as an alternative to the formulaic state limit that she just discussed. The first is the alternative expenditure limitation, otherwise known as the home rule option. This must be approved by voters at a regularly scheduled general election of the members of the governing board. It's good for four years if approved by voters, and any and all expenditures may be exempted. The next option is known as the permanent base adjustment. Uh, this permanently increases the base limit for the calculation of a city's annual spending limit. Uh, it would only grow thereafter by the inflation and population factors that Amber just mentioned. Uh, it must be for a specific dollar amount, and it, it, it's worth noting that it may not truly be permanent if city growth eventually exceeded that new permanent base that was adopted. There's one other option that is available uh, known as the one-time override. This is effective only for one year. Uh, it's really designed for things like a natural or man-made disaster, and it must also be for a specific dollar, dollar amount similar to the permanent base adjustment. But again, because of the one-year time frame, it really prevents it from being a long-term solution. As far as the city's history with alternative expenditure limitations, uh, Phoenix voters have approved a home rule option 10 times since 1981. Now, in the, in the 1980s and the early 1990s, that home rule option exempted certain enterprise funds, and that allowed the city to stay below um, the state expenditure limit. As Amber mentioned, we're now projecting to be roughly $2 billion over the formulaic limit. And so even if we were to exempt the enterprise funds, such as aviation, water, and wastewater, um, we would still be over the limit. So since 1999, uh, excuse me, the limit has been set at the council approved uh, adopted balanced budget every year. I will also note that there were two permanent base adjustments that were presented to voters, once in 1985, once in 1997, uh, but both of those were rejected by voters. So the city has a long and successful history with the home rule option. The city also has a long history of using uh, members of the community to provide input and insight into this process. And so we have, as Amber mentioned, Monica Villalobos here today. She is the chair of the Expenditure Limit Task Force, and she'll tell you a little bit more about the work of the task force and how they arrived at their recommendation. Thank you so much, uh, Mayor Gallego, uh, members of the council. Uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity. Councilwoman Pastor, thank you very much for the congratulatory note. No one was more surprised that someone wanted to marry me than me. So I appreciate that. Um, with regard to the expenditure limit task force, Phoenix is not required to, but appoints a citizen's task force, such as the one formed this year, to recommend an approach to the expenditure limit committee. Four citizen members 
members with strong mix of public sector, private sector, and nonprofit experience. All are very comfortable and have been very comfortable reviewing the city's finances and studying the impact of the state expenditure limit. I'd also like to take a point of privilege to recognize my colleague, my friend, Robin Reed. Thank you, Mayor Gallego, for recognizing his contributions to the state. Um, we missed him on this task force, but uh, we forged ahead the way he would have wanted us to. With regard to uh, the, oh, seeing you have animation. You guys are fancy. Okay, sorry. You want to drive for me? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, we held three meetings and devoted time outside of the meetings to studying the issue and analyzing city funds and final financial forecasts. The first two meetings focused on learning about the state spending limit, learning the city's history with the expenditure limit and previous options selected, studying and asking questions about staff prepared forecasts for city funds, including the general fund. The third meeting was spent discussing the available options, merits of an alternative alternative expenditure limit or home rule option versus the permanent base adjustment and recommending an option. The task force worked with staff after the third meeting to finalize our report and recommended ballot options. After reviewing the options available, the task force members voted unanimously to recommend continuation of an alternative spending limitation or home rule option, which establishes the expenditure limit at an adopted budget um, and that it be presented to the city council and voters. Further, as in the past, we also recommend the city continue its practice of engaging residents in the annual budget process to ensure each fiscal year's budget reflects the needs of the community. The basis for this recommendation to continue a home rule option is it provides the needed flexibility, transparency, and annual involvement of residents in setting the spending limit. The home rule option supports local control and affirms Phoenix's long-standing open budget process, resulting in a balanced and responsive annual budget. Another key benefit of the home rule option was the requirement for another review by an independent task force and vote of Phoenix residents four years from now. The task force considered the permanent base adjustment and one-time override options, but determined these options would not provide the flexibility the city uh, requires to continue existing programs and services or to expand those services uh, into, uh, in the future based on community input and engagement. The permanent base adjustment was not recommended because it would require a significant increase to cover the city's current level of expenditures and it may be confusing to voters. Additionally, as the report indicates, it may not be truly permanent. If the city exceeded the permanent base adjustment in the future, it would require voter action to adjust the limit again. Also, unlike the uh, home rule option, this option does not provide the annual community involvement for an independent citizens task force and two prior attempts at this option failed in 1985 and 1997. The one-time override was not recommended as it is only for one year and for the purposes of covering costs due to a natural or man-made disaster. This option also must be for a specific amount, so if, a, if it is a poor fit, um, it is a poor fit as a replacement to the home rule option. The home rule option accommodates new taxes approved by voters since 1979 to 1980 for uh, programs such as parks, preserves, public safety, and transit services. The home rule option also allows for key regional services to continue. These services have outpaced the Phoenix population and inflation. For example, Sky Harbor Airport is funded by fees paid by the airlines and passengers and provides airports but serves the entire region. It serves almost seven times more passengers than in 1980. New enhancements like the Phoenix SkyTrain and the Rental Car Center aren't included in the original expenditure limit calculation, but benefit both Phoenix and valley-wide residents. Other city departments also provide vital regional services, such as public transit through light rail and bus services. 
Other important city services such as water and wastewater and solid waste have implemented significant environmental and security mandates and expanded to meet the needs of the fifth largest city in the country. The city simply cannot provide the current level of expected services under the state imposed limit. As we reviewed budgets for other cities, believe me when I tell you that Phoenix runs a tight fiscal ship. I'd like to congratulate our city manager and staff for meeting the rapidly growing needs of Phoenix effectively and efficiently. In summary, the home rule option protects uh, important community services at existing levels and provides for future growth, accounts for the fact that Phoenix is a leader for the entire region beyond Phoenix residents, preserves the city's commitment to a transparent community engaged process that results in a balanced budget. Thank you for this opportunity to participate in this process. I'll pass it back to Amber. Thank you so much, Monica. So council today upon approval of the task force recommendation, the next steps would be to set the two statutorily required public hearings. These would take place at formal council meetings on May 1st and May 15th. Immediately following the second public hearing on May 15th, council would adopt the resolution to refer an alternative expenditure limitation proposition to the voters. June 12th, via ordinance, council would adopt the form of the ballot the election will take place on November 5th. So today, Council, we are asking for action to accept the task force recommendation to approve an alternative spending limit, home rule option, where the annual spending limit would be set at the adopted balance budget only after obtaining community feedback. We would set the public hearing dates for May 1st and May 15th. This would also authorize staff to take the steps that are necessary to prepare for the November 5th election. That concludes our presentation and we can answer any questions. Thank you, Director Williamson and Chairwoman and the entire team who worked on this, including the, the, the Citizen Committee. There's going to be very important stuff on the ballot. This may be one of the least understood, but most important. Local government will be at the bottom of the ballot. If you're watching, you already know local government is important, but we sure hope people make it the whole way on the very long November ballot. I've moved forward in this area for the last quarter century, and essential services will be so deeply impacted by this item. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? Yes, Mayor. I uh, make the following recommendations that we accept the task force recommendation. We approve home rule option with the annual spending limit, which equals our adopted budget. We're going to set our public hearings for May 1st and 15th and authorize staff to take steps to prepare for the November 5th, 2024 election. Second. We have a motion and a second. Diane Barker is here to provide testimony. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I'm Diane Barker in District 7. I'm in support of Home Rule. Phoenix has been having this for quite a while. It is an option that local revenues would be best spent with some oversight of the needs. And what I am suggesting to you, as what you've said, Mayor, on this ballot, it'll be important because uh, I think it's 479, the regional transportation. We're going to need to have consistency in the reporting and the city, anything that the city is spending particularly on this issue and any other department needs to be appropriately documented because if we were going by the state constitution, it's my understanding that they wouldn't allow, you know, these federal and state monies to be combined, but we're using federal and state, I guess, as far as our revenues. And if it's reported here, and at Mag Valley Metro, in the instance of transportation, it needs to be consistent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Council member questions or comments? Councilwoman Gordado. Thank you, Mayor. I would like to thank the task force, task force chairwoman Villalobos. Thank you so much for your leadership. I'm city manager Jeff Barton and Amber and the budget research department for their work on this item. 
Your input and support in this matter are important as we navigate through these important budget decisions. It is crucial that we comply with the state expenditure limit and I support the task force's recommendation to refer to the voters an alternative spending limit, also known as the home rule option on this upcoming ballot in November. By voting in favor of this measure, we are securing our city's financial stability. Failure to pass this measure could result in a substantial penalty imposed by the state, redu reducing revenue to the city and jeopardizing our ability to continue important general fund programs and services for our residents. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. The importance of home rule cannot be overstated. Looks like we are ready for a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Aye. Passes unanimously. Thank you so much for all the hard work that has happened and the hard work to come. Item two is the appointment for an interim council member for Council District 7. The city charter states that when a vacancy occurs with more than one year remaining in the term, the city council must appoint an individual to fill the vacancy until a special election can be held. The last time the appointment process occurred was under the late mayor, Thelda Williams. In the words of my predecessor, serving on the Phoenix City Council is an awesome responsibility. It takes courage to put your name in the ring and resolve to be willing to serve. Thank you to each candidate for answering the call to serve to public service. As outlined by the city charter and the memo sent by, to the city manager on March 23rd, the candidates will be called today in alphabetical order by last name, and each will have five minutes to address the council and the audience. After the candidates have, poke, have spoken, members of the public may have up to two minutes to speak, and council members have the opportunity to ask questions of the candidates. The council member will then vote to select the interim District 7 council member. As allowed by the charter, any council member may nominate any qualify, a qualified individual to fill the vacancy with no second required. The council will vote on the candidates in the order in which they were nominated, and the first candidate to receive an affirmative majority of the votes of the council members present will be selected to fill the vacancy. The interim council member will take office as soon as the oath of, the office, of office has been administered and signed, and will serve depending on the results of the special election. And I will turn to the city clerk to talk, walk us through the um, the two possible timelines. Mayor, members of the public council, uh, Mayor Gallego, this particular interim council appointment serves from the time the person is appointed through the canvas of the vote for the November 5th election. During the November 5th election, there will be a special election. That election will be for the, a person to be selected by the voters to fill the remainder of the council district seven term currently, and that will be, that person will either serve from the canvas of the vote for the November election, which is currently scheduled for November 20th, through the end of the current term, which is April 21st of 2025, 10 a.m., or if no candidate receives 50% plus one of the votes at the November 5th election for the special election, then the top two vote getters will go to a runoff, and the runoff election canvas of the vote is currently scheduled for March 26th, and therefore, uh, the person will serve from the day after March 26th through April 21st of 2023 for approximately three and a half weeks. Thank you so much. The city clerk received submissions from four candidates, the first of which is Gilbert Arvisu. So we will ask Mr. Arvisu to come forward. He will be followed by Carlos. All right, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm going to be as brief as possible as you all have access to my letter of interest and resume, which I would encourage you to skim over as I speak. As I mentioned in those documents, my family has a rich 100-year history serving downtown and south of Phoenix, and I continue those efforts to this day. I am not here on a whim. In what was submitted to you, I talked about my extensive leadership chairing the programming of one of Phoenix's largest health and housing providers, coordinating a coalition of dozens of community organizations to address health-related social needs, and much more. 
Most notably for District 7, I was in the DC office when John McCain announced his vision for the Rio Salado, building on the foundation laid by many local leaders. And when his staff learned that his only intern from Arizona had roots in South Phoenix, I was told I had no choice but to be involved. I still remember the day going back and forth on what we should call this project, this vision for South Phoenix, a historically disconnected community from the rest. And we settled on Rio Reimagined, which was approved in the recent bond election, and thus community engagement efforts by staff are ongoing, and I'm ready to step in and help with those efforts. But I want to highlight something that does not make the limelight, but will be critical for this appointment, the ability to answer the phones and respond to mail. Demonstrating that I can readily respond to these requests from constituents, I want to give you a very recent example. A neighborhood in downtown Phoenix had asked for updated resident permit parking signs last year for the Super Bowl and World Series. The signs were faded, unrecognizable, and therefore people were parking in their neighborhood causing safety concerns for this neighborhood where they lived, worked, and played. The request to replace the signs went unnoticed. When it came time for the final four, I made my concerns known to the host committee and city staff and worked with the neighborhood to get all the signs replaced, outdoing expectations as the signs now reflect light at night, the complete opposite of what the neighborhood had. And the neighborhood was ecstatic. What seems like a day-to-day -day activity to a community leader is a major win, even for the most overlooked neighborhoods. And I am ready to continue this leadership, engagement, and great work to advance our shared goals together. And I'll just note that uh, in the picture that uh, Councilwoman Pastor put up of uh, Cesar Chavez, he was wearing a button-down shirt, and that is why I uh, wear button-down shirts. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Carlos is next, followed by Michael. Mayor Gallego, Vice Mayor Stark, and council members, thank you for the opportunity to uh, make my case for the council district interim appointment. I reside, work, and vote in District 7. Our family has lived in the district for more than 20 years. I have a history of working in the nonprofit arena ranging from engaging community partners, leading anti-hate advocacy, and co-creating leadership development programs. My experience also includes serving as a YMCA child care manager, special assistant to a United States Senator, and as a voter outreach coordinator in Pinal County. I was born and raised in, the Arizona, in Arizona's Copper Corridor, which is at the heart of the state of Arizona, and that's where I gained the values instilled in me about caring for neighbors, Courtesy costs nothing, and community is everything. It's these values that will inform my services as a council member for the city of Phoenix. Additionally, I served as mayor for the town of Hayden, along with being elected twice as a council member and also served as a vice mayor. I publicly made three pledges. The first, to not run for the District 7 full-term council seat in the upcoming November election. Two, the salary earned from this interim appointment will be reinvested into District 7, except for my employer, um, to advance support and aid for nonprofit agencies and clearly to support residents. I will, third, I will fiercely protect the nonpartisan role of the district office and responsibly assist all residents regardless of party affiliation. The decision to submit my name for the appointment came with the deliberation and with approach, this approach that's crucial in both leading and serving on for the public good, it came down to three things for me, connecting, communicating, and creating. I know there will be tough and difficult issues to address and votes to cast as part of the job. In these instances and in my life as a whole, there's a verse I lean into from Joshua, be strong and of a good courage. And it's the word good that strengthens me the most. Be assured that when it's time to take a stand, I won't be shy. I'm not a perfect person, but I will try to be a responsive public servant and I'll be respectful to all. We may disagree on certain or most issues. That's okay, it's part of the democratic process. However, it doesn't mean that I'll dismiss or diminish you as a person, 
with a different viewpoint to mine. On public policy, my concerns are a direct reflection that residents ask me to be addressed. Crime, public, crime, public safety, heat resiliency, homelessness, and parks and recreation. I don't underestimate the power of using one's voice or joining with other voices to get things done. The same applies to joining forces to move forward on critical issues. I will seek out and invite others to join me, roll up our sleeves, and get to work. People want results, and they deserve to have them. I will work with anyone who acts in good faith to work on and find solutions to issues impacting residents of District 7 and as a whole city. I believe my record of direct constituents assistance, nonpartisan elected office, and service to community makes me well suited to serve the residents of District 7, and I thank you for your kind consideration. Thank you. Michael Nowakowski is next, followed by Lisa. Hey, our council members, thank you for this opportunity. About 30 years ago, my wife Delia and I were looking for a place to live, and we decided on District 7. We have six children, five boys and one girl, and we have a new member of our family, um, a grandson, that's going to be one years old in May. You know, this whole leadership came from really my father. My father's here right now. He's 90 years old, and he was a LEAP commissioner. And from that experience, I knew that service to others was something very important and something that ran in the Nowakowski blood. I believe I'm the only applicant that's really qualified with 13 years of serving as the council member of District 7. I was voted in three times by the residents of District 7 to serve that district. There's no one else that you're going to interview today that has that. 13 years of experience, 13 years of good times, bad times, heartaches, and all kinds of in-betweens. You know, one of the things I want to do today is really focus on our staff also. I remember coming in as a new council member back in 2008. We we're going through an economic downturn, and we had to cut and cut and cut. And it was our staff members that we sat down with, and at that time, I think Deborah Starks was actually one of those staff members, that we sat down and we said, you know, we're going to have to make some, some cuts to all of our budgets, about 20%. And you all help us be a part of this process. We reached out to the community, and we asked the same thing. Can you all help us out? And sure enough, that miracle happened, that everybody started to give in. Everybody started to work together. Our staff was willing to go on furloughs and give up some of their time. And thank God that at the end of my term, I was able to pay back all those great staff members that gave up that time and those efforts and all those furloughs and raises in between, we were able to give you some back. So thank you all. And I think that's what Phoenix is all about. I always said that we were a team. And it's really about a Team Phoenix approach with our staff, with the council members that we have. And hopefully, I would be that next person up there to help out. But I think it's about leadership. You need an individual that will lead. An individual that will sit people down from different walks of life and different opinions and try to find that common ground. And that's one of the things that I'm good at, trying to find that common ground. It might not be a win-win for everyone, but at least we were able to sit down and have that conversation and do what was best, not for those individuals or not for myself, but for the city of Phoenix. And that's what leadership's all about. And I believe right now that's what District 7 needs more and all. I was just driving down Central Avenue with my son, Michael Ray, taking him to um, ASU. It's his last year. And then hopefully he's going to be going into law school next year. But one of the things he said is, Dad, the street's still all torn up. The light rail isn't built yet? I go, no, son. And he goes, why? I go, that's a good question. I'll ask, um, maybe I'll ask some of the council members when I go and get interviewed on Monday, or Tuesday, I mean, I'm sorry. But, you know, to think about it, we need to be out there in the community telling them why. 
Why is it that we don't have a hospital south of the river? Why is it that we don't have a movie theater yet south of the river? Why is it that we don't have places for our families to sit down and eat? Why is that? We need to answer those questions. Why haven't we built that tech corridor that we promised the Estrella Mountain individuals that we were going to do so that people can work and live and, and play in the communities that they live in? I'm going to continue being that champion for public safety, for economic development, and I believe that I'm the best choice for this position because I have that experience of 13 years, that I have the compassion, and I would make sure that District 7 gets its fair share of amenities and resources that it deserves to have. So with that, thank you and God bless. Thank you. Lisa Perez is our next and final speaker. Good afternoon. Um, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of the council, thank you for the opportunity this afternoon. Um, coming to this decision about putting my name up for District 7 was a very hard one for me. I do community service and I'm involved with my community because I want to be, not for the pats on the back and the thank yous and the, oh geez, you did something great here. It's because I want to do something to improve my community, that's it. Quality of life for myself and my neighbors, that's what drives me to be so involved in my community. I do want to say what Michael said is exactly right. One of the um, things that's most important to me is bringing in the services and the amenities in District 7. I know that there's parts of us, us community activists, who people are saying, all you guys do is whine about stuff. But the reality is being in Southwest Phoenix, we're the furthest south, I touch Avondale and Tolleson. We don't have very many services, we just don't. We have to drive anywhere to go shopping. We have to, we don't have very good metro, so people can't take buses anywhere. It is a place that does need some, some improvement and some more infrastructure. One of the reasons I decided to run and put my name in it was just to put my name in. I wanted community activists across the city to know that your voice matters and saying something out loud is okay, even if we disagree, that it's still important to have the conversation and to be willing to let it go once a decision has been made. There was a recent zoning case in my area that I was pretty furious about. Council approved it, how to let it go. There has to be a bigger picture item for why the council chose to do that in my community and I have to respect that, it's as simple as that. We know that the person who serves in District 7 answers to the constituents that they serve, but have to be in mind, keep in mind, that the city overall, it has to be the priority. And I understand that, and it's important. And this council person will have to do that. I would like to follow a little bit of what, Councilman Asari's office was very helpful. I didn't know her when she ran for office, um, but she has been, was responsive, she was, uh, passionate about issues, and if she disagreed, she didn't hesitate to pick up the phone and say, so sorry, not gonna happen. And I appreciated that, uh, the respect that she had for the community and the respect that she had for myself and others uh, showed, and I would like to make sure that anybody who has that, has, wants to have that relationship with the council member, that they should, and they should always feel free to ask the question. We may not agree, we may disagree, but I think it's important. Those of you that don't know me, most of you know me, I serve right now on the City of Phoenix Planning Commission, which is something I wanted to do. The very first time I saw my packet, I about passed out. And, um, but it has been, it's gonna sound weird, it's been a joy. I have learned so much from being on the Planning Commission. I've learned about other places within the city. I've had the opportunity to talk with individuals who are fighting as far up as uh, Anthem area. But getting to talk to them and hearing their side about it has been very interesting and has been really quite a pleasure. So I've had contacts all over the city now that I get to work with on issues that come up. Because for me and for them, those zoning cases are about their quality of life and they should be heard one way or another and it's important. A Couple things I just wanna mention. Uh, I also serve on the Australia Village Planning Committee. Um, I've had the privilege of serving on the Go Bond Committee a couple years ago, and then what was formerly known as the Electric uh, Vehicle Task Force, all of which has been just amazing opportunities to be able to learn more about the city and the individuals that I got to serve with, which was important to me. Lastly, my community service also stems from me being an a older mother, I'll just leave it like that. I have a 13-year-old, had him late in life, but I want my child to learn civic responsibility, that it's his job to give back as much as he gets, and he's an only child, so, I mean, I'll just tell you what it's like, he doesn't have an only child. Maybe he's a little bit spoiled, I'll be honest, um, and I enable that, which is not good, but I want him to understand it. So he's out there with me for cleanups, 
setting up my tents for gain events. He's out there when I go to speak at things. I'm going to drag him to the budget meetings this week because I want him to understand the opportunities that even as kids, how you can get involved and why it's important to be involved in your community. Before I end, I want to thank all my friends who sent me encouragement to go ahead and do this, even if I don't get the appointment. I do want you to seriously consider me. But I also want to say thank you to them. Always speak out on the issues that are important to you. Your voice does matter. And we need a council person who is going to stick up for everybody in the community and for the city of Phoenix. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much. All of the applicants have volunteered so much time with our city and our community, and we want to thank you for your commitment to a better Phoenix. That concludes the applicants, and then we will go to public comment. We'll begin with Oscar, followed by Onesimus. Good afternoon. My name is Oscar. I live in the district. I'm one of 200,000 constituents from District 7. Um, to me, this is a no-brainer. You got somebody that's got 13 years experience, a former council member, versus other individuals, which they all sound good. They all, they all um, have a lot of things going for them. You know, you have a, a former mayor of Hayden with a population of 600 people, you know, versus 200,000. Um, it, to me, it seems like this is going to be a four-month interim, and what better position would, would it be than to have Michael, with experience, go in there than having to train somebody or teach somebody the ropes? You know, you have, um, you have somebody that served on the school board. Um, do they have that experience with the city? And you have the other candidate that... that my notes here, that ran for a race in District 8, and now he wants to represent District 7. My question is, what district does he live in? Uh, the boundaries may have been redone, I'm not sure, but that, that's a question that needs to be answered. And um, so I'm an advocate for Mr. Nowakowski. Thank you. Thank you. Anismus is next. Hi, Mayor. Hi, Council people. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me today. I know the last time I spoke to you, I probably had two minutes. I don't see a clock running. Oh, it is running. Well, I am here in support of Michael Nowakowski for the appointment to District 7. I'm invested heavily in that area. I've helped a lot of uh, candidates campaign in that area in District 8, District 7 for LD uh, Senate as well as LD House. I know the community very well and have spoken to a lot of the residents and voters of District 7. So a lot of the issues I understand fully. Michael has represented that community and has addressed a lot of their issues over the years and has done a very good job, including also the entire city of Phoenix from an economic standpoint with the development of the downtown corridor, helping with the Cotton Center development with South Phoenix and the Levine build out. There's more to be done. We're in a new era right now as a city. It's a fast developing, fast growing city and it has posed some major challenges. Michael Nowakowski has demonstrated the ability to collaborate with colleagues like yourself to be able to move forward with a, with, with a combined mission for all of Phoenix. He will come back in this interim period of time, I'm sure, and support each and every one of you in getting things done that you need for your residents and community. Um, I have a lot of confidence and trust in him. I first got to know him at Levine Little League Baseball wherein his family participated over the years and grew up there, and I was a coach um, for one of the teams every year. So I've had an opportunity to observe him, talk to him, learn from him, and um, I think he'll be a great addition to this council in this time to continue to work and move things forward as you seek to, or as the community seek to elect someone. Please, think favorably to uh, appoint Mr. Nowakowski. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. That concludes public comment. We'll now go to council member questions and we'll begin with Councilman Kevin Robinson. Mayor, thank you very much. And I trust you can hear me okay? Beautifully. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry I could not be there, but as you know, my wife and I are on our way to um, Portugal to celebrate our anniversary and her birthday. And um, But I, I know how important this particular process is, so I want to be a part of it. Uh, the first question I have, and it's for all, actually for three of the candidates, because I think Mr. Galindo Elvira, El, and I apologize if I'm saying the name wrong, I think he made it very clear that he is not seeking to run um, for the office permanently. But the other three candidates, Mr. Arvizu, Mr. Nowakowski, and Ms. Perez, can I hear from each of them whether or not they plan to seek the position permanently? Wonderful. So we'll do alphabetical order if that works again, and then I'll go reverse alphabetical order next time. So for Mr. Arvizu, do you plan to run for the four-year term? Okay, say it to the microphone, so that's perfect. Um, no, in my uh, letter of interest, I'm not running for special any any of the elections or the um, or the the different uh, options that there are. Thank you. Council Member Robinson, this is Michael Lewakowski. I remember happy wife, happy life. So you're doing the right thing, and I am running for this position. I'm running for the special election, and I'm going to be running for the um, four-year. Thank you. Mayor, members of the council, Councilmember Robinson, this is Lisa Perez. I have put my name in for the special election, and I, I kind of want to explain why. Right now, the way that this election is going to go, whoever gets appointed today will only serve until November. If somebody wins a special election, there would be a different person, and then whoever's running for the, four, the full term, if that's a different person. So District 7 has a chance of having three different representatives within one year, which is not really great. I put my name in for special election. I have not made a full decision about whether or not I'm gonna run for the full term. I am discussing that with uh, friends and colleagues, um, but I'm leaning towards it because I do wanna see some continuity. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank all of you for your answers. I, I do appreciate that. And the reason I asked that particular question is that I think it is critical that the voters in District 7 pick their representative. And clearly this is something we are doing bounded by charter. We're picking someone to fill a vacancy for a short amount of time. I think it's gonna be critical for the residents within District 7 to pick that person. So I'll, I will leave it at that for that particular question. Um, I do wanna ask another question. Mr. Nowakowski, it's more for you. And um, you had mentioned in your um, presentation that um, you want to do what was best for the city of Phoenix. You mentioned you'd served in good and bad times, and I'm not trying to be a stick in the mud or anything along those lines, but, you know, I, I know how important these positions are. I understand how politicians are viewed these days, and I think it's critical to be beyond reproach. Could you expound a little bit or a little bit, because I know there was an issue surrounding you and some ethical dealings um, when you were in office before. And I, you know, I think it's important for us to understand your position on that, where you, um, where you stood, and I know things were discontinued because then city manager Zerker removed the issue from um, as a sale of property and such. But can you tell us why we should vote for you with having that in your background? Um, what exactly are you talking about? I know that there was a, a question of insider, I, I used the word insider trading for lack of a better word, but there were some issues with some land dealings with your employer, with you, and there were a host of things. It's in the papers, it was in the papers, I should say. Right, so, so Mr. I, I would think that you should remember that. I remember it very well. So Council Member Robinson, it, it went all the way to the um, Supreme Court and they dismissed it saying that there is no evidence and they don't know, even know how it actually got to the Supreme Court. So it was a lot of inside politics that was going on. Um, my employer at that time was the Cesar Chavez Foundation. They were trying to build some affordable housing in downtown Phoenix. I run the radio aspect of the Cesar Chavez Foundation. I have nothing to do with the housing aspect of it. 
So basically, somebody tried to make it seem, a developer that lost the bid, tried to make it seem like I had some insight, information to actually help out the um, Cesar Chavez Foundation with that. If you want to go into more details, we could. There's a bidding um, chart that you have where you get points. And the point system is if you were going to be an owner, if you would pay for the land outright. And they said yes after I reviewed it. They uh, actually, the scoring was really the Chavez Foundation, I think it was Trammell Crow or something like that, that put in for that, that they basically outscored the rest of the individuals. And basically, the person that came in second place that was upset about this whole system, I mean, situation, and that brought it out to the media to try to throw out a, a new bid in which they were successful on and took it to court, basically wanted to create condos instead of affordable housing and rental property. So that's why they really lost the bid because they didn't follow the, the, the scope of the... Um, the RFP. So if you'd like to go into more detail, I think you can ask the, um, your staff to give you the whole scoring and the whole detail, and then you'll figure it out yourself. Okay, well, thank you for that. Again, I asked the question, like I said, not trying to be a stick in the mud or anything like that. I just think it's critical that, the, the, that we, as the elected body, the folks who are going to chose you know pick this person on a temporary basis we have all the facts and know where you stood and what you understood what you know what your position was with it um you know we, i wasn't there um i was in the city at the time i remember it and i'm sure others would too and i think that's why i thought it was important for you to explain and and i thank you for your explanation it is appreciated now, thank you council um, member outside of that, and you're going to find I, out council oh. member when you become an advocate for affordable housing or for the minority community that you're going to end up getting in, involved with political football. And that's exactly what happened there. Thank you. Thank you. And we w would welcome the can council I, member I, applicants I, to stay near the microphone because I think there'll be a few additional questions if, you, if you'd like. Council member Robinson. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Um, Mr. Nolikowski, I get that. I do understand that. But, you know, I, I think, like I said, having you explain it means a lot, it def definitely to me. And, you know, it's always that appearance of an impropriety that um, sticks with people. So it's good to hear your, you know, how it turned out and everything else, because that may not have been known by a lot of folks. And I think that's important. And, the, Mayor, the very last question I have for each one of the candidates is, um, have any of you had an opportunity to speak to um, former Councilwoman Ansari? Wonderful, and I believe this time we'll go in reverse alphabetical order, so we would start with Perez, Lisa Perez. Uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, uh, members of the council, Kevin, um, Councilman Robinson, just an opportunity to speak with her in general, or? Yes, but the reason I asked this question for her education, you know, I, I just, she was doing a wonderful job. She was voted by in by the residents in District 7. I was just curious as to whether or not you had an opportunity to talk to her and to get a feel for what she was doing, what her thoughts were, and that type of thing. I did reach out to her because I didn't want to put her in any kind of a weird position. But um, she, uh, we were sad to see her leave, I'll be honest with you. Um, we, she did the courtesy in a year before she, right before she announced, she called a few of us. And we had dinner and we discussed it, and she told us that she felt the passion to go on. Um, so I haven't talked to her about this. She may be watching, her staff is watching right now, um, but I just didn't want to put her in a weird position. Thank you. Council Member Robinson, this is Michael Nowakowski. The last time I talked to the council member was actually at the um, Levine Barbecue. I was the MC for the cow milking that um, basically she won that cow milking of Levine, so she's known as the queen of cow milking out for this year. And that was the last time I had a conversation with her. All right, thank you. Council Member Robinson, this is Carlos Ganindo Elvira. Before I answer, I'm gonna wish you and your wife safe travel. 
Um, I did not and have not spoken to council, former council member Ansari regarding the appointment or her role in office. Thank you. Councilman, this is Gilbert Arvizu. I have not spoken to the former councilwoman about this position. Thank you, Mr. Arvizu. Mayor, that concludes the questions I have at this time. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Councilwoman Hunt Washington. Thank you, Mayor. I also have a few questions for, the, for those that are interested. Um, my first question is, um, I feel like you will be representing the constituents of District 7. I would like to hear from your perspective, what are the major issues that you believe that District 7 is facing, and what are your plans to address those? And then I have multiple questions. Do you want me to give them all now? or? Okay, we'll I think multiple questions, one. assuming they are not so complicated that it would be unfair to... Yes, so it's not unfair. So the other question that I wanted to kind of tie in, one of the major issues right now I think that's facing District 7 is the new proposed homeless shelter in that area, 75th Avenue and Van Buren. Um, the reports are there's not complete neighborhood support for this, and I would love to hear what you plan on doing to help rectify that issue. Is it, is it so two questions general priorities and then specific to the, the 71st Avenue. Great. And we will go in alphabetical order again. So I believe the two are actually connected. Um, it has to do with community engagement. As I said in my speech, District 7, particularly south of the river, has been historically disconnected from the rest of Phoenix. And that is why I focused on engagement in my speech, so not going in there and telling folks, hey, this is what is good for you, but listening, listening and responding to the needs of the community. And as I put in my letter of interest and in my resume, uh, I focused on responding to the needs of the community. Um, so again, for that particular uh, homeless shelter, uh, I would go and engage the community. Um, I engaged the community at the 24th Street in Washington uh, shelter. Uh, I was there at all those meetings uh, as connected to my, my employer. Um, so I was there and, and heard the concerns there and I'm willing to, to do the same for um, that location. And is there anything else you would like to add specifically about what you believe to be the major issues faced in District 7 and how, what you plan to do to address them? So. I believe the, the major issues as, as what has been talked about is, you know, the lack of services uh, south of uh, the, um, the river. Um, there is, there's no trauma one hospital. There are small hospitals uh, south of the river. Um, but I believe that that is the, the, the biggest concern is how can we get, um, services to south of the river and it was also mentioned earlier about amenities these are topics that have been talked about for for many many years um, we talked about uh, with Rio reimagine how they're at central and the river bottom can we put a cultural plaza to to recognize uh, the residents of South Phoenix and their and their commitments to um, to the rest of Phoenix so I believe that is is part of the part of the problem, and again, it goes back to what I've been saying, is this disconnection from the, the rest of Phoenix. Thank you. Council Member Hodge Washington, thank you for your question. Um, there's so much related to each other in District 7, but I'm gonna go first with um, the applicability of law enforcement heat resiliency and the shelter. Um, I think what needs to happen is, yes, the community engagement with the neighborhood, but not community engagement as a checkoff point. It needs to be real and it needs to be culturally appropriate as well as addressing it both in English and in Spanish because they're concerned about their children. On Sunday, I did take a drive out to the area and actually walked from the school to the proposed site area and found it that there was a safe distance. But that won't matter if we're not able to communicate that effectively to the neighborhood and to get their input. They have ideas. 
like for example, there are gonna be safeguards in place for the shelter because it won't be a walk-up shelter. There will be behavioral services that will be provided and we're heading into the hottest time of the year. 65% of this interim appointment takes place during the hottest time of the year. So all of those combined together are really important to address and to address it without being shy and to address it in a way that matters to the community because once community is involved, they're invested in the success of a project. This is Michael Nowakowski for Councilmember Robinson. You know, District 7 is really split up into um, five areas. We have the downtown area where, I mean, 16 years ago, you wouldn't have believed what you see now. And that was really because we worked together with the community, with individuals that had vested interests in downtown, from ASU to all the small businesses, to the individuals that live downtown. And I believe that's what made downtown so special and now what we see in downtown Phoenix. One of the biggest concerns that there was was having a grocery store, the food desert, and especially in the downtown area and in the, um, what, do, what do you call it, the Capitol Mall area. And we were able to, I was able to champion bringing Fry's Supermarket downtown Phoenix. So that was some of the concerns in downtown. Safety for our students making sure that people feel safe. But at the same time, if you're gonna come down to one of the 200 bars or restaurants or our um, local businesses in downtown Phoenix that we have now, it's the parking issue is one of the biggest issues. How do you park in downtown Phoenix without paying 40 to $50 to come down to an event or so? So we really need to figure out how to help out those local businesses in downtown Phoenix how to help them survive, and at the same time, how can we attract people to downtown but not bankrupt them when it comes to parking, right? The other thing is Maryville. Maryville is hungry and needing more programs for youth. Keeping our kids active, active during the summertime, during after school hours. We need to create more soccer fields, football fields, activities for our young people. You know, the, um, there's a privately owned West complex that's right there on 99th and McDowell. That's being sold now. We have apartments being um, built right there. So there's about 18 soccer fields that are gonna disappear. So where are all those individuals that use that West complex that's privately owned going to play soccer now? Right now, it's a nightmare just trying to figure out how to schedule all those different soccer teams. I just looked at um, Council Member Betty. I, she's nodding her head like she understands what those nightmares are. People are calling, wanting to know how can they get a soccer field? How can they get more activities? How can they get baseball fields, softball fields out there? And, it, and public safety. People want to live in their neighborhoods and feel safe. We need more police officers. And how do we do that? We need to figure that out. We need to figure out how to recruit more officers and making sure that those officers come from those neighborhoods that are in the most need. And I think little by little, we'll figure it out, but we need to figure that out. That's one of the biggest issues out there. Um, it's not in the district anymore, but it used to be Desert Sky Mall. That was going to close, and we've basically figured out bringing a developer, an individual that created a mall in Los Angeles and converted it into a Hispanic uh, Mercado atmosphere. And that's exactly what they did at, at um, Mercado de los Cielos. And so you need to think outside the box. Let's, let's go to other cities, other states, and steal their great ideas and bring them here to Phoenix to make sure that the metro centers of the world, the I still call it um, um, Chris Town Malls of the world, and the Desert Skies don't close, right? And um, the other thing is you got Estrella. Estrella is out there and we have all kinds of opportunities. We talked about creating the, the, the when we advocated for the 202 freeway, the Ed Pastor freeway, um, basically we sat down with the community, all the stakeholders, and they said, well, what we need to do is create quality jobs out here. 
And one of those things was creating a corridor for tech, a tech corridor, where we can bring high paying jobs to District 7 along the freeway that people can have access. They can come and live and play and be there. And, and that's one of the things that when I turn on the TV and I hear that Queen Creek or Surprise or Avondale just got a tech company and they just basically, I feel like they stole it from us and we should have that right there in the Estrella Mountain, that freeway corridor that we have out there. When you talk about Levine, oh my God, people are talking about that hospital that we need. We already have a hospital zone for it and with a helicopter pad and all that. I think we're going for a second one. We can zone all the properties that we want and stuff, but we need to go and find those hospitals that want to be in Levine, a full-blown hospital. When I was on the council, we had two, people, two, in the, um, two companies that wanted to open up their hospitals there, and they were fighting over and negotiating. I'm not sure what happened with that negotiation. I was termed out, and I was out of that, that negotiation aspect of it. We need a Costco. I mean, we lost the Costco in Levine going all the way to Surprise. And they said that we were going to be next, and Buckeye already got one. So we need a Costco out there. You know, the other thing is a place for families to sit down and eat. We need more restaurants. We've got enough fast food restaurants. We need a sit-down restaurant where families can go after a graduation, after a birthday, have their birthday parties there, and enjoy each other. When you talk about South Phoenix... We need an overhaul on South Phoenix. When we talk about the light rail, I mentioned my son, Michael Racing. Damn, I'm graduating from ASU, and they started. I started um, ASU, and they tore up the, um, Central Avenue, and it's still that way. Why? And we need to answer those questions. Why? About three months ago, I got a call from a Western Wear, a local business right on Central Avenue, saying, Michael, I called... District 7, they transferred me over to light rail. They, um, they, then they transferred me over to the contractor. Then they transferred me out back to the city. And I've been going around and around in circles. So can you help me? I go, yeah, absolutely. So what I did is I called Marcus. And I said, Marcus, we're having this problem. Is there any way you could just sit down and talk to that person? He goes, absolutely, Michael. And two days later, Marcus and Debbie Lopez went out there and basically had a conversation with this individual, and they fixed it, just like that. They basically had a, they tore up his, um, his parking lot and just basically left a four inch hole in the middle of his parking lot where people could actually fall into or their cars can actually get stuck in, in that trench that they had right there. They cut off the power of his lights in his parking lot. And he said, Michael, those are my security lights. And I've been calling and calling and calling because I need those lights on so nobody will break in and steal my boots and my clothing. And then barricades along the street so that my sign already got torn up. I just bought that sign seven months ago and a truck hit it because there was no barricade to warn it that there's a sign right there. So basically, when you have communication with individuals, we have staff members. And that shout out to Debbie Lopez and Marcus for really doing their job. And once they're asked to do their job, our staff's out there. So Representative Washington, I mean, I can go on and on and on, but those are some of the big issues that are in our community right now. Just public safety is another one that we need to make sure when you pick up that phone and call 911, that police officers are there to protect and to serve our community. And if a loved one is having a heart attack or that's ill, that the paramedics and the fire department is there within minutes, right? So, and regarding the um, homeless shelter, I believe, and once again, I told our staff and I told our consul, and you weren't a part of it when, when I was on the consul, that we were going to get sued. We were going to get sued with what's going on in CAS and that we need to do something about it. And I basically fought that we cut it down to what we promised the community was 300 beds and all the services surrounding around, around CAS. And basically, that didn't happen. 
On the contrary, they wanted to increase it to 1,000 bids, 1,000 more bids than the 800 that they had. So what I'm afraid is going to happen, because I signed that petition about, about 35, 34 years ago to allow CAS to happen there, but the petition that I signed said that basically there was going to be 300 bids surrounded with services, and that would be the max. They passed that 300 bids way long ago. So I believe that's going to happen the same thing on the Van Buren site. The other thing is we as a city need to do better. We need to do better in communication. We can't just go in there and tell the community this is what's going to happen. No. We need to help out our homeless community, and this site has been suggested. What do you all feel or what do you all think? But no, what we've done is we've gone in there and we said, this is what we're going to do. And we had a community meeting, not to get input, but to tell them what's going to happen. And then it's not even going through the planning and zoning, where people can actually go and protest or say their opinion. That has to be more transparent and more open to the process. And that's wrong. That's very wrong. And you as individuals that are sitting on the council right now should not let that happen. You should have it go through the right procedure, which is the village, which is the planning and zoning, and back to you as the council member. And it's going, instead of going to a committee of individuals that we all don't have say so, are you all, to make that decision. Thank you. Mayor, members of the council, Councilwoman Hodge Washington, I'm going to start with the Navigation Center. Um, I live down in the area by where it's at. Um, I was an early supporter of it. I was not happy the way that it came out, but for those that know zoning, it's an A1 property that only needed a use permit and did not have to go through the regular process for planning and zoning to get the permit to do this. I do believe they should have gone out earlier, but I think the city did a good job of trying to have, they had two community meetings, they met individually with individuals that were upset about it. They also went to organizations that requested meetings to discuss it in full. Um, I did send a letter of support to the Board of Adjustment to approve it because I think the process of what the city is doing is trying to locate homeless facilities around the city is something that we need to do. Everybody's going to say not in my backyard. Nobody wants to have it. But I also add that I'm on the Fowler Elementary School Board, so the people that were testifying about the school that's right there, I'm a board member for that school. We take safety and security of our children as the utmost importance for that. So I know why they're talking about they fear for their children not being safe in schools. I took a little offense to that, but I understand it. They're a parent. I'm a parent. And it is, but it is our number one priority to make sure that all of our children get going to that school. But Talking to our police officers, our local police officers, they need this tool in their tool belt to help them. There's no beds available for them to take people, and our housing population, our homeless population, in the fur western region is now growing. We didn't have it even a couple of years ago, but it's there and it's growing, and I do believe that this is something we need in our community. And I hope we'll put in other communities. Um, as far as problems that we have in the district, I mean, I can go on and on and on, but most immediate in the west side, we need more infrastructure. I mean, these are kind of bigger things. We need infrastructure. We need more uh, uh, transportation options. Uh, our bus lines stop. They don't, go con they don't connect from road to road, which is problematic for people to get from to and fro. And we don't have amenities. We don't have very many sit-down restaurants. We have no medical out there. We have one urgent care on 99th Avenue and... Uh, Lower Buckeye Road, so we have no other medical facilities. In the Levine area, I, I tri Levine area in the southern area, they need more retail to catch up with all the multifamily that's been entitled down there. And Levine, love them to death. They'll be very vocal about what they need down there and what they want down there, and I love it. Um, but that is something that is true. And in both Estrella and the Levine areas, we also have issues with county because we both have a lot of county land that surrounds our areas. And is a uh, difference, for, we have the river that runs through it and people use the dry riverbeds to shoot, to have parties, to do all kinds of stuff down there. And that is very problematic. And again, we have that issue where do I call the city of Phoenix police? Do I call Maricopa County Sheriff's Office? And half of the time, depending on what road you're on, you don't even know who you're supposed to be calling. So that is problematic, and I would hope the communication between um, the city and county can get a little bit better on some of those issues. In the downtown area right now, you're struggling, well, not even struggling, the amount of growth in the downtown area is just phenomenal. Even I come downtown, and right now, I think one of the issues they have is the cleanup for the construction for light rail is a big deal, and also, 
trying to mold how many more residents are living downtown versus those that weren't. Just as, uh, no, as Michael just said, so many more people are living downtown, and so having that urban feel and opportunities for the people that live down there and balancing it with the growth that's happening. Um, bigger picture, can, will we get light rail down I-10? I think that'll help the Maryvale area and our area. And then SR-30 coming through, if Proposition 479 passes, um, I will literally be able to say that freeway from my bedroom because it'll be right, right below where I live. But it's a major piece of infrastructure, just like what the Loop 202 is. I don't see it necessarily as a problem, although it's going to be a very big undertaking that we'll have to deal with in District 7. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is my question. Thank you so much. Any additional questions? Councilwoman O'Brien. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> I'm not sure the order, but I have three um, questions surrounding public safety, so maybe if they can take them all at one time. I'm okay, and I think this time we just did alphabetical, so it would be reverse alphabetical. So. And again, would welcome if people just want to stay close to the microphone until we're done with questions. So when, when I was elected to office, um, the, there were some concerns around public safety, and certainly our police department did not necessarily um, feel supported by the city council. Additionally, we are struggling to hire officers. Um, we are in a situation where our, our firefighters are concerned about response times, as are we, and we're doing everything we can to provide them with resources that they need. Um, I'm curious what your stance is on public safety. My stance is I support them 100%. Um, I know that a couple of years ago there were people like, we don't want cops in our neighborhood, we don't want to see police officers. My community wants to see police officers, and we're friends with them. I talk to my CAOs all the time. I run a block watch in my area, um, and we have the privilege of getting a new fire department in our area, which I just want to throw that in there really quickly, but I'm 100% supportive of our officers. Um, I got the privilege of going to a Taser training, I don't know if she's like a taser training, and I'm going to go do a police experience this weekend um, with the City of Phoenix Police Department. So for me, 100%, no doubt, I'm supportive of our police officers and our firefighters. Thank you. Um, do you believe that our current city leadership is capable of reforming our police department without a consent decree and DOJ monitor? Yes, and I know that that's a really tricky subject for some people, but I don't think the consent degree, I'll just say it, it is the way to go. And I've seen other cities and what they've gone through and how many years it's taken them to get from, out, from under the consent decree, and I'm not going to pretend to say that I know everything about it, but it does not seem, and I would hope that the city does not go in that direction. Would you, um, would you sign an agreement in principle without reading the full DOJ findings report, which would commit the city to negotiate in good faith towards a consent decree? I know this has come up too. I'm, it's hard to sign something in good faith when you haven't read all the documents. And I know that we're going back and forth with DOJ by getting the documents for everybody to read. I don't know why they wouldn't just do that. It seems a little weird to me. Um, again, I don't know all the basics. I only just know what I've read and what I've been told. And I don't know if I could do it in good faith just on something that I have no idea what the report's going to say. Thank you. Council member, 100%. Um, back in 2007, I actually ran in by enforcing the law. And people were saying, are you crazy in Maryville and South Phoenix? Well, I knocked on every single door at least once. And people were saying, we want more police officers. We want our neighborhoods to be safe. We want our kids to be able to go to the park and play at nighttime. So I became the chair of public safety and one of the biggest concerns I had was, when I was there, we had so many police officers and firefighters that passed away. We have these beautiful services and memorials and all that, but it's too late. So what I created was the Star Spangle on Banner Celebration. Basically, it was honoring all the fallen police officers and firefighters. And right here on Washington, we would have a banner it would be a red banner for firefighters with the picture of the firefighter that basically passed away, the year that he passed away and the, the year of his service, right? And then basically we would do it in blue for the um, police officers. And then we had a, 
educational component that was along with it, that if you had an iPad or a smartphone, that basically you can go in there on, a, on this special app for teachers and bring your class and go through a field trip and you can find out more about that firefighter or police officer and you find out that they weren't just firefighters or police officers, they were basically coaches for their baseball teams, you know, little leagues and, and ministers and, and helping out the youth and all that. So we got to learn a little bit more of who that individual was. And then we would end it with a big celebration at the Memorial Day celebration with fireworks. And then we had young people that would write um, messages on these um, little boats and then they would light them up and they would go on the, on the um, lake out there at Cesar Chavez. And then we had fireworks with, uh, we would recite the names of each fallen police officer and firefighter. So absolutely, we need to support. We need to make sure that they know that they're loved, that they're wanted, and that they're respected. And I think that's one of the reasons that we created that. The other thing that isn't that I created that doesn't exist anymore is a crime summit. We created a crime summit for all the block watch individuals. At that time, it was District 8 and District 7. And then we had all the precinct commanders out there, and we had the police chief. And basically, it was a day out at the police training um, complex that they can actually have an hour with their commander of their precinct and learn about the services that the, each precinct offers to the community. There's a lot of people that don't understand that it's not just a precinct. You can use it for meetings, there's services, there's resources that a lot of people don't know about. So it was a time for individuals that wanted to meet their commanders and the community action officers that they can have that dialogue for an hour. And then afterwards, the mayor, myself, and the police chief would have a question and answer with any individuals that were there at that crime summit. And then they had a chance to go through the training just like any police officer would have um, through the complex. And then, the, and then your, the next question, which is, do you believe our current city leadership is capable of reforming our PD without a consent decree and DOJ monitor? No, absolutely. I believe they do. They can. And would you say sign an agreement in principle without reading the full DOJ findings report? No, I would not sign, sign it at all. And I would, I would actually talk to our past um, sheriff, Paul Pinson, and ask him what was his experience. And what are his thoughts? And I think we all know what his thoughts are. We heard it very clear on the media and what he thinks about the county and how they, they are going through and how it's a waste of money, right? Thank, Thank you. you. Councilmember O'Brien, thank you for your three questions. I may need a refresher on some of Happy the questions. To help. The first one is yes, I support and respect our public safety departments, both the police department and the fire department. Um, the work that they do is incredibly difficult. Um, and we are not there for every incident that happens, but we need to be supportive of our police department. And I have had the chance to work specifically with the bias squad unit in terms of hate crimes and incidents when I worked for a national hate, anti-hate organization and I saw the care that they took with victims. I saw the care that they took to ensure the institutions that might be targeted were informed and were protected. So I know the value um, that our police officers bring to the community, and it's not just the ones that are patrolling, it's the ones that are investigating. It's the ones who are out there protecting um, and serving our citizens. The second question. Second question is, do you believe our current city leadership is capable of reforming our PD without a consent decree and DOJ monitor? Yes, I do, because um, every system every large operation there is always a time to improve and there's always a process that should be in place to to uh, reform so yes um and i think it's important that we we do it carefully thoughtfully but yes to your answer with regard to the consent decree no i would not sign sign uh, sight unseen
So yes, I am a major supporter of public safety. The reason is my dad was one of Arizona's first EMTs at 16 years old, 20 year volunteer firefighter for the city of Phoenix. Uh, he was there when all they had were jackets and helmets and the little rubber boots and we saw and he saw that evolution and so it's really ingrained in me um, from from that perspective um, I also you know we're as we know the community action officers they keep getting moved around because um, because of budget constraints and things like that so I'd be uh, really interested in seeing how we can get community action officers more back more involved and and I've heard from them personally like that they would like to be more involved. Um, as far as the second question, I don't know if I have all the information. What I, the information I do have was what was provided at the community meetings. Um, the, the road show, as the media called it, um, and the media uh, kind of bashed the city's road show. I don't know why I attended. I thought it was good. I thought great information was given. I thought our uh, city leadership gave some good plans as to how we can uh, reform. Uh, my biggest concern was this idea that, oh, well, if it worked in St. Louis and Baltimore, then it's gonna work for the city of Phoenix. I'm not really a big fan of the copy and paste uh, type of, of policy. Um, so that's what I got from those uh, community meetings. So because of that, um, I wouldn't necessarily sign uh, you know, uh, I would sign an agreement saying I think we can handle it ourselves based on the, the information that, that I have currently. Oh, okay, thank you, appreciate that. Thank you, Councilwoman. Any additional questions? All right, uh, Councilman Waring. Well, actually, can I ask a question of staff? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so this would be for Attorney Julie Cree. So uh, I think it was only this morning or maybe last night uh, that I heard there might be concerns about the eligibility of former Councilman Nowakowski because he had served three years. Uh, this was news to me. So I'm just curious, is he eligible? And if not, why not? Because he's out of office now. He served the three terms. My understanding was if you serve two full terms as mayor, then you can't come back as mayor sometime down the road. But I don't remember that, that was the case for council people. And, and in recent memory, both Sal DeCicio and Thelda Williams both served more than three terms in their lifetime. Now they hadn't served three full terms. And Sal was actually appointed for his second term. So uh, secondly, there were uh, concerns about someone who did not apply, that were out in the news media, about their eligibility because they've been a state legislator. So I just going forward, as long as this is gonna be the process, if nothing else, I hope before this comes up again, um, that we have some consistency about who is eligible for these appointments. So mayor, members of council, councilman Waring, so we did have a question come up about the consecutive terms and our city charter is silent as to essentially a break between, I'm sorry, between those consecutive terms of office. So I basically let everyone know that that, that could be an issue because our charter is silent as to that issue. So, uh, So we could potentially get sued, and if and what happens then? An injunction, District Seven would go without representative. I'm trying to figure out what we might expect. I don't think anybody wants to be sued in court. Feel reasonable to have someone who is not eligible. But we obviously can't hurry because we're not lawyers. We're not no lawyers, but second, it's not really our job to sort that out. So, like, what would a judge do if it's just? So, Mayor and Council, it, it, there's a possibility of, of a challenge. Like I said, there's, there's a possibility there's an open legal question, and it could just be an action to see if that person is eligible to keep the office, which is called a quo warranto action. 
I think in the past, Mayor and Julie asked for guidance from the Attorney General or some such. Maybe it, it's not practical here today, right now, but I would just suggest going forward we, we get some guidance because we, we have quite a few of these appointments. Um, I ran against somebody who was appointed for my seat. Greg Stanton was appointed. Tom Simplot beat somebody who was appointed, and Betty beat somebody who was appointed. Can't even count how many that is, but that's like seven or something, I think, just in the last maybe 20 years. So, uh, so it, it comes up pretty regularly. We just might be prepared. Um, given the quality of life at the legislature, they might want to come over to the friendly confines of the city someday <laughs> down the road. We might want to. <laughs> particularly on days like today, they're probably like, why the hell did I ever want to be a state legislator? So um, what was I thinking? Uh, poor judgment working for you. So um, having been one, I can make those kind of jokes. Uh, but I just like I can make jokes about Illinois. Being from. But I, I, would, I think it would behoove us just to get some kind of clarity on both of those issues. I don't know how we do that, but I think we've done it in advance in the past. So there's that. I also wish we had a process where people, as far as I know, the only person who could up here live in District 7, I'm not asking for your address, Mayor, would be the mayor. Otherwise, this process involves all people who don't, by definition, live in District 7. Um, so that's, that's a tricky one. Uh, I think, and if we could come up with a different plan and maybe submit that to the voters because this is something that comes up pretty regularly. I have a perfect plan, but I think anything better than, oh, we might appoint people who are real eligible. There's got to be a better way. So thank you, Mayor. I appreciate it. It sounds like there is no clear answer. So Thank you. I'll turn to Vice Mayor Stark for a motion. Thank you, Mayor. I would like to nominate Carlos Galino Alvira. Thank you. No motion, no second is required. Roll call. Guardado? Yes. Hodge Washington? Yes. O'Brien? Mayor, may I explain my vote? Please do. Thank you. Um, I will be voting yes today for um, Carlos, and I will be doing so because um, he will run for the special election, but has committed to not running for the full four-year term. And so with that, I vote yes. Pastor? Yes. Robinson? Yes, Mayor, may I explain my vote please, also? Please do. Thank you. Um, for pretty much the same reasons that Councilwoman O'Brien stated, I will be voting for uh, Mr. Galindo Elvira also. But um, all candidates really showed a great deal of stick to itiveness, grit, and everything that it takes to be in the office. But I like the fact that he has stated that he is not interested in running for the position permanently. And I think that is a question to be decided by the residents in District 7. So my vote is yes. Thank you. Waring? Uh, Mayor, I'd like to explain my vote. Please do. Uh, so I, I think Kevin said maybe fly in the ointment or something earlier. So. First, I'm going to vote no, uh, but we had talked, Carlos, and I, uh, I think you understand my position. Uh, so this, I think you understand my position very clearly uh, because I was very pleased with your presentation when uh, you appeared uh, before Deb Stark and I a few years ago about the Ethics Commission and then uh, I think a subsequent iteration of that same process. I was very impressed with your resume. I think you'll make an excellent member, I have no doubt. I think that about all the members, I served with Michael Nowakowski. He was a great colleague. I enjoyed him very much. Um, uh, you know, Lisa, I used to see in the hall and so forth. So I think you all would have done a fine job. I do have concerns about this process. I won't belabor it, but I've just thought that we should have people who are independent, who are not going to run. Um, and I do appreciate that you check one of those boxes. Uh, I just think, in fairness to the voters who are not going to get to participate, um, that, that that should be something we should try to do get somebody who's a little more independent. But I appreciate your resume. I wish you all the best of luck. and uh, appreciate you understanding my position. I'm voting no. Stark? 
And Mayor, if I can explain my vote. I, first off, I want to say uh, thank you for all the speakers today and the people who wanted to serve District 7. I'm impressed by Carlos' um, dedication to the district. I know he's lived in it for 20 years, but I'm very impressed that you're willing to donate your money to nonprofits, your salary. So that really speaks highly of your dedication to the residents of District 7. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. There you go. Carlos, we have worked together for 15 years, whether it be you helping set up leadership programs for the Latino and African American community, your fight against hate, or your work building coalitions. Because District 7 and 8 are quite close in many areas, you and I have actually been quite close neighbors for and seen each other often at particularly shopping opportunities, and it's, it's good to uh, be able to vote in your favor. I think you will be a great interim council member. I vote yes. Passes 7-1. Thank you, congratulations to our newest member of the Phoenix City Council. There will be a swearing in shortly. We are adjourned. <laughs>